On November 2, 2012, 16-year-old Alicia Moore went missing. Alicia was seen on camera footage from the school bus she was riding on. The footage showed Alicia exiting the bus around 3.30 p.m. near her home. Alicia lived with her mother, grandmother, aunt, her aunt's husband, and her great uncle in Greenville, Texas. At the time of Alicia's disappearance, her great uncle, Michael Wofford, was the only one home. He later testified that he did not see her come home that day. When Alicia did not return home by 8 p.m., her family started searching for her, reported her to the police, and began posting flyers around town asking the public to help locate her. On November 5, 2012, Texas Department of Transportation workers discovered a black wicker trunk along Highway 47. This trunk was found around 40 miles away from where Alicia went missing in Greenville, Texas. Inside the trunk was Alicia's remains. Alicia's body showed multiple ligature marks around her neck and various abrasions on her face and head. I am going to put in a trigger warning here. There is talk about sexual assault. It was determined by the medical examiner that Alicia had been sexually assaulted right before her death. Authorities believed that the perpetrator was most likely someone that Alicia knew and trusted, and it was presumed that the perpetrator sexually assaulted Alicia, then killed her to mask their identity. Just months before Alicia was found, her mother went to the police to report a 49-year-old man who had been sexually abusing her. He was arrested and charged, however, he was behind bars around the time of Alicia's murder. Many dead-end tips came in, and one woman, Dee Williams, even claimed that Alicia's mother had messaged her on Facebook, offering $5,000 to kill Alicia. When Dee Williams didn't show up to her meeting with investigators, her confession was dismissed and no further investigation into this lead was conducted. Another woman claimed that on the afternoon of November 2nd, she was driving behind a school bus when it stopped and let out a young girl matching Alicia's description. The woman noticed a black pickup truck make a sharp turn and started slowly following Alicia. The woman found this to be suspicious and turned around to see if she could follow the vehicle, but she did not see Alicia. She said the man driving the vehicle was a Hispanic man with black hair parted at the side. With no real leads, police decided to take samples from Alicia's boyfriend and all the men living in her home. Police identified the DNA belonging to Michael Moore as a match to the DNA found on Alicia's body. Michael Moore was Alicia's great uncle, not to be confused with the uncle who testified against her, Michael Wofford. Michael was just visiting Alicia's family at the time, and before Alicia's murder, Michael Moore actually had just returned home from California to Grand Prairie, Texas to take care of his father. He would go down to Greenville and visit family every other weekend. It was reported that Alicia and Michael had a warm relationship as he was teaching her to bake, bought her presents, and took her to the store. Go ahead and go watch part two. This is part two of the disappearance and murder of Alicia Moore. Where we left off, police identified the DNA found on Alicia's body as belonging to her great uncle, Michael Moore. Michael and Alicia reportedly had a warm relationship as he was teaching her how to bake, buying her presents, and taking her to the store. On one occasion, Michael even took Alicia back to Grand Prairie with him to visit other relatives. After investigators determined that Michael was most likely the perpetrator, they executed search warrants to obtain access to his house and car. Unfortunately, nothing relevant was found. None of Alicia's personal items, including her backpack that she had on her that day, were ever recovered. Shortly after this investigation, Michael was taken into custody on charges of capital murder due to his DNA being found on Alicia's body. While Michael awaited trial, he sent multiple letters to Alicia's aunt claiming that the DNA evidence was planted and the police had filed false documents. However, in 2013, a jury found Michael Moore guilty and he was sentenced to life in prison. This is what happened to 11-month-old Maria Jose Enciso and how this man kidnapped her and is believed to have sold her for an illegal adoption. Maria Jose was born on October 14, 2009 to her mother Maribel Enciso and her father Ivan Monroy. Maribel says that she loved being a mother and she was so happy to have Maria Jose as her daughter. Even though she only had her for a short period of time, she said that they had an amazing and beautiful relationship. The family lived together in Tecamac, Mexico, and Maribel and her husband Ivan had saved up enough money for them to open their own optometry. So Maribel would work at the office and she would bring Maria to work with her every single day. While she was busy attending patients and running the business, Maria would just be sitting on the ground playing with her toys or she would be sitting on a high chair. And this is just what worked best for the family. On September 21st, 2010, Maribel was working at the optometry with her 11th month old daughter Maria Jose by her side. It was about 5 o'clock so Maribel was getting ready to shut down the store so as she was grabbing all of her belongings, a man riding a bike pulled up to the door. The man asked Maribel if he could come inside and at first Maribel was a little bit hesitant but then she realized that she recognized the man. 
This man had actually come to the store a week earlier and Maribel had actually done an eye exam on him. So she recognized him and she asked him what he needed and he said that he was here to order some glasses. And even though it was 5 p.m. and Maribel was ready to close the store, she decided to let the man inside. This man walked inside the store and immediately closed the door behind him. And Maribel says that in that moment, she knew something was about to happen. And then this man pulled out a knife and threatened Maribel. He told her that if she didn't put her daughter on a chair next to him, he would kill the both of them. So because Maribel feared for her life and also feared for her daughter's life, she did exactly what he said. She put her 11th month old daughter Maria Jose on a chair and then the man walked over to Maribel and slit her throat. She fell to the ground and then she saw the man walk over, pick up Maria Jose, pick up a computer and then leave the store. Somehow Maribel got the strength to get up and crawl outside and ask for help. Police and an ambulance quickly arrived, but unfortunately it was too late. Maria and the man were already gone. Maribel was immediately rushed to the hospital and doctors didn't have high hopes for her. They believed that she would most likely not survive and if she did survive, she would most likely never be able to speak again. She was in a coma for an entire week and thankfully she was able to survive. She woke up, she had her voice and she immediately began asking for her daughter and for her husband. That's when she learned that her daughter was still missing and that the number one suspect to police was her husband, Ivan. I understand that police always look at the family first, but Ivan had a clear alibi for the day Maria went missing and there were witnesses that saw him at work. Police clearly had tunnel vision and for an entire week, they solely focused on Ivan. However, now that Maribel was awake, she told police that Ivan was not the one that kidnapped her daughter and gave them a clear description of the man. And a month later, police had finally found the man. Jesar Crespo Garcia. This is part two on what happened to 11th month old Maria Jose Enciso and how this man kidnapped her and is believed to have sold her in an illegal adoption. So a month after Maria's kidnapping, a man named Jesus Crespo Garcia was arrested. And he wasn't arrested because he kidnapped Maria. He was arrested because he had R-worded a 14-year-old girl. The mother of the 14-year-old girl was so angry with Jesus that she decided to print flyers with his face on him and place them all over the community. Well, Maribel saw this photo and she immediately recognized him as the man that kidnapped her daughter Maria Jose. She told police this information and as he was being arrested for the R-wording of the 14-year-old girl, they also began to question him for the kidnapping of Maria Jose. And he confessed. He admitted to everything. He said says that after he kidnapped Maria Jose, he brought her to his parents' home and told his parents that Maria was his own daughter. He said that the baby mama was a drug addict and that now he was going to be taking care of their child. Of course, his parents doubted him and they were a little bit confused because they had no idea that their own son had a child. But they still took Maria in and took care of her. They believed their son, but one day they were watching TV and that's when they saw Maribel on the news asking people to be on the lookout for her missing daughter. That's when they realized that their son was lying and instead of calling the police and handing Maria over to her parents, they just decided to kick the son out of the house. That's when Hayside took Maria and brought her to live with him in another apartment. He knew he wouldn't be able to take care of Maria on his own, so he decided to kill her, wrap her in a blanket, and throw her in the river. However, police went and they searched the river and they ended up finding the bodies of two men, but they didn't find the body of a little girl. Besides that, when police went to go investigate his apartment, they saw that he had a handful of baby food, baby clothes, diapers, all of this baby supplies. It wasn't just enough supplies for Maria. It seemed like this was enough supplies for multiple babies. Because of this, police believe that Jesar Garcia is lying and that he actually sold Maria in a legal adoption. Unfortunately, they believe that this might not be the first time that he has done this. They believe that he might be part of an organization and that he received help in kidnapping Maria. He arrived to the eye doctor's office in a bicycle, so how was he able to ride his bike carrying Maria and carrying a computer at the same time? Police believe that he must have had help and that there was someone else waiting in a car nearby to help him escape. On top of that, all of the baby supplies in his apartment makes it seem like this is something that he frequently does. He said was sentenced to 82 years in prison for the attempted murder of Maribel and for the R-wording of the 14-year-old girl. Unfortunately, to this day, he refuses to tell Maribel where Maria is. Maribel continues to fight for justice and she won't stop until her daughter is found. She believes that her daughter is still out there and she needs the public's help in finding her. Maribel created this Facebook page that I highly recommend you guys follow to keep up to date on Maria's investigation. She is asking for people to share her daughter's photo, flyer, and story and to help spread the word. She believes that her daughter is still alive and she wants Hesa to just tell her the truth. If you know anything about what happened to Maria, please contact the number on the screen. 
This movie was inspired by an even more disturbing true crime case. Room is about a woman who was held captive for seven years. It's inspired by Elizabeth Fritzel, who was held captive by her father, Joseph Fritzel, for 24 years. She was locked in the cellar at age 18 and went on to have seven of his children. He created a small hidden apartment in the basement where Elizabeth and some of her children would live as his second secret family. Upstairs, Joseph and his wife, Rosemary, Elizabeth's mother, went on living a semi-normal life. Rosemary was under the impression that Elizabeth had run away, even receiving letters from her. With the basement becoming crowded with children, Joseph even began bringing babies upstairs. He would stage elaborate plans that Elizabeth had left them on their doorstep. In 2008, after their eldest 19-year-old daughter became very sick, Joseph agreed to bring her to the hospital and even released Elizabeth. She confessed everything that happened with the promise that she'd never have to see her father again. He remains in a high-security psychiatric prison and apparently has dementia. Elizabeth and her children were moved to an unnamed town, given therapy and medical treatment, and attempt to live a normal life. This is everything we know about Nikita Dragon's arrest. On Monday night, the 26-year-old was staying at the Good Time Hotel in Miami. At 6 p.m., police were called about a disruptive guest. Security guards said that Nikita was causing a disturbance for a long time and was walking around the pool area without clothes. Some reports say she was nude, others say she was naked. Security accused Nikita of tossing water on them when they confronted her. When police arrived, they went up to Nikita's room, and they said there was loud music coming from it. When Nikita finally came to the door, security said that she's at risk of being kicked out. She then allegedly slammed the door in their faces, reopened it, and said, do you want more? A police report says she then tossed an open water bottle at them, which hit and spilled on an employee and a police officer. Nikita was immediately arrested and charged with felony assault and two misdemeanors, disorderly conduct and battery. Her bond was set at $2,000. Officers also placed Nikita, a trans woman, in the men's unit in a Florida jail. Not only is this against protocol, but it's extremely dangerous. She's safe now, but imagine if she was in a cell with the wrong person.